Hello and welcome. This is our 24 World News Program, and these are your headlines. Russian President Vladimir Putin traveled to Tehran for talks with the Iranian and Turkish counterparts on several issues, among them the Syrian matter. A heat wave crushing Europe spies northward Monday. Britain and fuels fierce wildfires in Spain and France. Frustrated Panamanians have taken to the streets in protest for more than a week, amid an open anger over fuel prices. Algeria and Italy succeeded on occasions of Mario Draghi's visit to Algeria in taking a step forward towards the establishment of exceptional strategic relations. Hello again and welcome. I'm your host, Abdurrahim Kashour, and those were today's top stories. First in our topical stories, Algeria and Italy succeeded on the occasion of Marius Draghi's visit to, Alge uh, to Algeria in taking a step forward towards the establishment of exceptional strategic relations through the holding of the fourth Algerian-Italian Intergovernmental Summit crowned by the signing of 16 Memorandums of Understanding and Cooperation Agreements. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi, accompanied by a number of top-ranking officials, paid a working visit to Algeria. The two parties have finalized a major energy deal that makes Algeria the biggest supplier of gas to Italy and the biggest gas exporter in the African continent. In energy, I want to say that tomorrow an important agreement will be signed between Occidental, Ini and Total with the amount of $4 billion, which will allow to supply Italy very large quantities of natural gas. Italy is present in Algeria with a significant investment in the energy sector, in the infrastructure sector, in transport, in the agro-industry. Our participation in the economic and social life of Algeria has never ceased. Several agreements and memoranda of understanding on various fields of cooperation were signed between Algeria and Italy in a ceremony chaired by President of the Republic, Abdelmajid Tabun, and Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi. President Tabun affirmed that the joint statement of the fourth Algerian-Italian Intergovernmental Summit institutes a new phase in an increasingly effective bilateral cooperation between the two countries. <laughs> I express my satisfaction with the positive results of the 4th Algerian-Italian Intergovernmental Summit and the signing of important agreements in various fields of endeavor, in addition to the joint statement which will institute a new phase in the increasingly effective bilateral cooperation and outline relations between the two countries, willing to strengthen their deep historical ties. Algerian Prime Minister Ayman bin Abdurrahman revealed on Monday that the value of trade between Algeria and Italy had exceeded $4.3 billion during the first five months of 2022, after Algeria and Italy had signed on Monday 15 memoranda of understanding and bilateral cooperation agreements in many fields. I will note here that Algeria is Italy's largest trading partner in Africa and the Middle East, as the volume of trade between the two countries in 2021 amounted to 8.5 billion US dollars, an amount that is expected to rise in the current year, according to estimated volume of bilateral trade, that is. During the first five months, trade exceeded 4.3 billion US dollars. According to the President Taboon, the meeting was an opportunity to discuss bilateral issues of common interest in the Maghreb region, to which the two countries attach a particular importance. The meeting allowed the exchange of views on various regional and international issues in light of unstable global situation. Global food security was also exposed as a clear threat, notably in Africa and particularly in the Maghreb. President Taboon pointed out to the importance of joint action to participate and contribute positively to the establishment of peace and security in the Mediterranean region. 
Still in the local matter, today Sonat Rock has signed one of the biggest contracts of the trimester in collaboration with Occidental Total and any companies. The new collaboration portrays Algeria's effort to, to develop and encourage foreign investment. Marim Zian, tackle the story. Sonatrack and its partners Occidental Petroleum, ENI and Total Energies signed a hydrocarbons production sharing contract, extending control over two blocks in Algeria's Birkin Basin. The contract comes under Algeria's new hydrocarbon laws, approved in 2019 and is part of the Memorandum of Understanding, concluded between Sonatrack and its partners January last year. Oxy CEO Vicky Hala visited Algerian Minister of Energy and Mines Mohamed Arkab in early July for the first time. We believe this is a very momentous occasion uh, for Occidental and for Algeria because we truly believe that this country has vast resources yet to be developed. And we believe that working together with our partners, ENI and Total Energies, we're going to end Sauna Track. We're going to have the capability to unlock some new and exciting things here in, in Algeria. For his part, NECO Claude Descalzi highlighted the strategic partnership with Sonatrak aimed at long-term investments in Algeria to maximize asset value. Similarly, Total's senior vice president for the Middle East and North Africa, Laurent Vivier, said the sign-in marked a new milestone in the strategic partnership with Sonatrak. All parties sharing the contract are committed to pursue the development and exploitation of the perimeter through a program of works. يشمل برنامج الأشغال هذا المشروع تطوير واستغلال محيط بركين كتلة 404. The program for this project includes the development and exploitation of the Birkin Basin blocks 404 and 208. In particular, works of high intensity, three-dimensional seismic survey, drilling of 100 oil wells, converting 46 wells into wells using WAC technology, completion of blueprint studies, guidance and improvement to facilities performance, implementation of oil fields digitization solutions, implementations of two pilot projects, as well as environmental projects to reduce carbon footprint. An estimated $4 billion will be deployed for the implementation of the development and exploitation plan. The total investment volume included in the development plan for this project is estimated at about 4 billion US dollars and will enable the extraction of an additional volume of approximately 1 billion barrels of oil equivalent, allowing to raise the average recovery rate to 55%. The conclusion of this contract reflects the willingness of all parties to pursue their partnership within the contractual perimeter of Birkin and develop their cooperation through a stronger seek of new partnership opportunities. Sonatrack will not stop here, but will also invest three or four more projects by the end of the year, according to the Minister of Energy. In the same line of thought, in a press statement, Algerian President Mr. Abdel Majid Taboun stressed the Algerian and Italian parties' keenness to affirm the importance of joint action to contribute to the restoration of peace and security in the Mediterranean region, pointing out in the contest of full conformity in the visions with Rome on the Sahara issue and the Libyan crisis. Libyan media confirmed the chief of staff of the Libyan army, Mohammed al-Haddad, held a meeting with the chief of the staff of Haftar Abd al-Razak uh, on Monday morning after the latter arrived at Matika airport in the capital Tripoli, accompanied by members of the Joint Military Committee from the eastern regions. According to the local media, al-Haddad and uh, Naduri meetings comes with the framework of completing the meeting that was held in Serat earlier. As part of military consultations, analysts stated that Naduri and Al-Haddad will discuss in Tripoli the implementation of ceasefire agreements from the security and military sites. To Russia-Ukraine fire, Russian President Vladimir Putin travels to Tehran for talks with the Iranian and Turkish counterparts on several issues, among them the Syrian matter. Bilateral relations, regional and global subjects are also expected to be discussed in this summit. The meeting also comes as Russia Tayyip Erdogan seeks to finalize a deal to allow for the export of trapped Ukrainian grain. 
Ukraine State Emergency Service stated a Russian shell smashed into a two-story building in the eastern Ukrainian town of Chosturk on Monday. The bombing left at least six civilians dead as they were sheltering there. The emergency service said on Facebook that rescuers found the bodies in the rubble and pulled three people out alive, but one later died in hospital. The Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu has made a visit to his troops in the Donbass region where he affirmed that Moscow's priority is destruction of enemy long-range missiles and artillery with high-precision weapons. Meantime, the conflict continues in the Donbass after an eight days pause. Nabil Khazini. Moscow has stopped up its military operation in Ukraine. This video, released by the Russian Defense Ministry, shows the Russian army destroying Ukrainian military targets, including a HIMARS rocket launcher system and a storage facility housing Harbin anti-ship missile. Long-range air-based missiles destroyed a depot in industrial plant in southern Ukrainian city of Odessa that stored Harpoon anti-ship missiles delivered to Ukraine by NATO countries. And this footage shows the extent of destruction in Kharkiv's biggest residential district, where in every corner buildings partially collapsed, and only a few remain unscathed in Ukraine's second biggest city. The destruction of enemy long-range missiles and artillery with high-precision weapons, from which shelling of residential areas of settlements in Donbass is carried out, as well as intentional arson of fields with wheat and storage facilities with the grain, are the priority, says Russia's Ministry of Defense, during a visit Sergei Shoigo made for his trips in eastern Ukraine. In Toretsk, a city in the Donetsk region, shelling continues. Galina Dorova woke up to the sound of explosions, followed by a storm of black smokes and fire. There was like a boom. I opened my eyes and heard my child shouting, Mom, but he didn't run towards me. I was very scared, and I hoped that he still had his legs and his arms. Then I ran to my child's room. It's right there. And it was terrifying. Thank God he's alive and well. Russia announced that it had officially ended the operational pause of its army decreed eight days ago, and the bombardment resumed with more intensity in the Donbass, whose total control is the main short-term objective for Moscow. President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine has fired the head of powerful domestic security agency, the SBU, and the state prosecutor general, citing dozens of uh, cases of collaboration with Russia by officials in the agency. Sunday's abrupt sacking of SBU chief Ivan Bakanov, a childhood friend of Zelensky, and the prosecutor general Iran Vandiktova, who played a key role in the prosecution of Russian war crimes were announced in executive orders on the president's website. Six hundred fifty-one criminal proceedings have been registered for treason of the state and collaboration activities by employees of prosecutors' offices, judicial institutions and other law enforcement agencies in the case of 198 criminal proceedings. EU Foreign Minister signed off 500 million more in military aid for Ukraine as top EU diplomat Joseph Borrell stressed the effectiveness of sanctions on Russia on Monday. The aid decision came after a video debriefing on the latest developments by Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuliba, who said he was grateful for the new fans, which brings the EU total to 2.5 billion euros, but still urged the 27 nations to provide more. Russia is trying to destroy Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation and at the same time unleashing a global food and energy crisis. The ministers were unanimously agreeing on the need to continue to stand firmly with Ukraine and to lend Ukraine with all our support in its fight for freedom and independence. Ukraine needs more arms. We will provide them. 
The Russian President Vladimir Putin said on Monday that it would be impossible to cut off Russia from the rest of the world and that the country must focus on developing its own technology and supporting fast-growing companies. Clearly, we cannot develop in isolation from the rest of the world. And it won't be like that. In today's world, you can't just, you know, circle everything with a compass and put up a huge fence around yourself. It's just not possible. The Russian energy giant Gazprom has told the European buyers that it cannot guarantee gas supplies because of extraordinary circumstances. Russian gas supplies have dropped via major routes, including via Ukraine and Belarus and through Nord Stream 1 and the Baltic Sea, where Canada sent a turbine, or rather a turbine for the Nord Stream gas pipeline to Germany by plan on the July 17th after repair work had been completed. The European Commission signed a deal with Azerbaijan on Monday to double imports of natural gas by 2027. The announcement came after European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen visited back on Monday morning for talks on increasing energy supplies to EU. The deal, which intends to bring imports of Azerbaijan natural gas to the least 20 billion cubic meters a year in 15 years, which help the EU reduce its reliance on Russian energy. Supply of gas from Azerbaijan to the European Union. Indeed, with this MOU, we commit to the expansion of the Southern Gas Corridor. This is already a very important supply road, uh, route for the European Union delivering currently more than 8 BCM billion cubic meters of gas per year. And we will expand its capacity to 20 billion cubic meters in a few years. Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi said China and European Union should observe the mutually beneficial and win-win cooperation between the two sides and oppose any acts that violate the law of the economy. For his part, EU High Representative Jose Borrell said that the European Union believes that the two sides share more common interests from Iran differences than in willing to pursue one China policy and conduct more strategic coordination and cooperation with Beijing. In Great Britain, Boris Johnson survived a confidence vote in his government on Monday, giving him seven more weeks in Downing Street before his successor takes charge. The third round of voting for the race of choosing the next prime minister is taking place on Monday with the ballots cast this evening. Nabil Khazin. As the sky is witnessing the hottest days in Britain, the prime minister was having fun in the air, enjoying his last days in office. But when landing back on the ground, things were more serious. Boris Johnson's government has won a late-night confidence vote in the House of Commons after a bad-tempered five-hour debate. The question is that this House has confidence in Her Majesty's government. As many... Boris Johnson chaired his final cabinet meeting before standing down as a PM. The Prime Minister is now expected to continue in his role for the next seven weeks until a new Conservative Party leader is chosen to replace him. But this is the question. Who is going to be Britain's new leader? A result not different on top, with Rishi Sunak keeping the lead with 115 votes. This time, the least fortunate was Tom Tugendhat, who is the only candidate not taking part in any of Boris Johnson's cabinet. He left the race with only 31 votes. Now, the four remaining candidates go to another round of voting on Tuesday. The field will be cut to two tomorrow, with Conservative Party members then having the final say. In these last days, remaining contenders took part in TV debates, with each expressing their views on British and international issues. One candidate will be eliminated by their fellow Tory MPs, leaving just four in total and there is no threshold to meet. Whoever comes last faces the axe.
Sri Lankan lawmakers on Tuesday put forward the nominations of three candidates due to the run in Wednesday's July 20 presidential election. Acting President and Prime Minister, former Cabinet Minister and the leader of the National People's Power Party were the three candidates nominated during the brief parliamentary session. I am happy to nominate Member of Parliament Honorable, in accordance with Presidential Election Special Provisions Act of 1982. I forwarded the letter by him accepting the nominations and stating his willingness to carry out the duties if elected. A trial has begun in Florida to set the sentence of the author of one of the worst school killings in the United States. The trial of the Parkland High School, which was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, left 17 deaths in 2018. The gunmen who attacked the high school of Parkland in Florida in 2018 returned to court Monday for the penalty phase of his case in which the jury will decide whether he is sentenced to death or life in prison without parole. Nicholas Cruz pleaded guilty in October to 17 counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of 14 students and three staff members at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Uh, the student in my classroom and the door where the shots were coming through and you could hear the shots. <laughs> the lead prosecutor, Mike Sands, seeking the death penalty for the gunman detailed for jurors Monday how Nicholas Cruz coldly mowed down his victims, returning to some as they lay wounded to finish them off with a second volley. Those actions of killing 14 children, the athletic director, a coach and a teacher, is why we're here today. Cold, calculative, manipulative and deadly. This massacre. Cruz stalked a three-story classroom building and fired his AR-15 semi-automatic rifle down hallways and into classrooms. Cruz sometimes walked back to wounded victims and killed them with a second volley of shots. After Sat spoke, Cruz's lawyers announced that they will not give their opening statement until it is time to present their case weeks from now. That is a rare and risky strategy because it gives Sats the only say before jurors examine grisly evidence and hear testimony from survivors and the victims' parents and spouses. Double doors comes running. <clears throat> a heat wave brawl in Europe spilled northward Monday to Britain and fueled vicious wildfire in Spain and France, which evacuated thousands of people and scrambled water bombing plants. Uh, planes and firefighters to battle flames in tender dry forests. Across Western Europe, there were signs of what French authorities warned may be a heat apocalypse. Amid surge and wildfires, more than 1,500 people were evacuated from their homes in France, according to the French Interior Ministry. The EU said it was monitoring closely wildfire ranging in southern member states, sending a firefighting plane to Slovenia over the weekend, adding to recent deployments to France and Portugal. The Commission continues to work tirelessly to mobilize help to those in need. Now, in addition to the firefighting airplanes mobilized to Portugal, France and Albania last week, the Commission deployed another plane from Croatia to Slovenia over the weekend to battle a fire in Nova Gorica. In Britain, airport runways melted and trains were slowed out of fear for buckling steel tracks. Meteorologists suggested that Tuesday could be the hottest day ever recorded in some parts of the British Isles. Over the past week, there have been more than a thousand heat-linked deaths in Spain and Portugal. Hospitals are straining as they also cope with the renewed surge in coronavirus cases. Hydrologists are warning of the deeper effect of widespread drought, shrinking water tables and battled harvests. This summer will be really a serious challenge for us all, for the national authorities as well as for us as coordinating the response. Last summer was bad already. And last summer we had nine activations of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. Um, for forest fires. This year, we already have had five, and the height of the summer is still ahead of us. The EU researchers also warned that the lack of water and strong heat are driving cope yields lower in the countries.
Weather forecasts predict more than the same, adding to an already very critical situation that will exacerbate the effects on agriculture, energy and water supply. Frustrated Panamanians have taken to the streets in protest for more than a week, building up anger over fuel prices that have nearly doubled to show their general dissatisfaction with the government. The protest group Wednesday, despite President Lorenzo Gortizo ordering Tuesday the control of prices of at least 10 products of the basic food ba basket and austerity measure in the government in addition to the temporary freezing of fuel prices. That's uh, all what we have for now. Thank you so much for being with us. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.